Welcome everyone. I'm Nicole Gurren. I'm a Professor of Urban and Regional Planning here at the University of Sydney and I chair the Urbanism Discipline here in the School of Architecture, Design and Planning. Before we start this evening's panel, I want to acknowledge that the University of Sydney is built on the unceded ancestral lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to the traditional owners as well as elders past, present and emerging. And particularly as we turn to a discussion this evening of the future planning for Sydney and beyond, it's important to recognise the knowledge that is embedded forever within Aboriginal custodianship of country. And I welcome those of you who are listening this evening to introduce yourselves via the chat and tell us where you're coming from. Tonight, we're hearing from five fantastic speakers. We've got Michael Storper in Paris. We've got Stephanie Barker here in Sydney. We've got Irene Duckett in Tasmania, Carl Goddick in Melbourne, and Di Griffiths also with us in the studio this evening. As you listen to the speakers tonight, feel free to ask a question via the chat box. It'd be great to address your question to a particular speaker if, um, if there's someone that you'd particularly like to address your issue. And if we don't manage to get through all of your questions this evening, we'll pass them on to the panel members afterwards. Feel free to make a comment as well. We'll be including some of the comments in the festival monograph. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Storper, our first speaker this evening. Professor Storper is a Professor of Economic Geography at London School of Economics. He's also affiliated with the Centre de Sociologie des Organisations at Science Po in Paris. Apologies, uh, Michael, for my pronunciation. And he's also a Distinguished Professor of Regional and International Development at the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA. Los Angeles. He's an internationally recognised scholar and author. I believe he was named one of the world's top scientific thinkers for his citations in sociology, which is phenomenal. But he's very well known for his books, including The Rise and Fall of Urban Economics and Keys to the City, How Economics, Institutions, Social Interaction and Politics Shape Development. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much for that, for that introduction. I'm going to share screen here. Um, so hopefully this will work. Yes, here it comes. All right, I'm gonna launch right in and uh, let me preface this by saying that I'm going to speak about a, a paper that um, I've written with two colleagues, Rich Florida from the University of Toronto and my colleague, um, Andres Rodriguez Pose from uh, London School of Economics. And it's an unpublished paper, so we'll be very grateful for any feedback that anybody has on our ideas. And um, the other thing I'd like to say is it's, it's quite speculative because we're in the middle of this COVID pandemic. So thinking about the post COVID world is not the usual sort of like social scientists with a whole bunch of good data saying what we think we know, but rather trying to extrapolate a little bit and um, sort of just, you know, go for it and thinking about the future. So, um, so you have to um, hopefully understand that, that, that um, these ideas are necessarily speculative. And obviously I acknowledge uh, my colleagues for, the, um, for uh, all of the good stuff that's in what I'm about to say, but if I make any errors, they're all my own. Um, let's get a little perspective, all right? So I think um, this is not the first pandemic, nor will it be the last. In fact, I think many um, climate scientists are telling us that uh, with climate change, that the um, human um, wild frontier is changing um, more rapidly than in any place, any time in the last few hundred years, and that we can expect in the 21st century more of these zoonotic um, uh, type events to uh, affect us as an integral part of the um, ecological change that's going on with climate change. So uh, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, it's just this is a, probably a reality. Um, and of course we have past pandemics. In fact, one, the big one of about a century ago, there were a few since actually that people have forgotten about, um, as well as of course um, cholera in 19th century Europe or 
the many bubonic plagues of the early modern period in, in Europe, they did wreak city, uh, have havoc in cities and they also generated substantial changes in sanitation and engineering and, and, and temporary big shocks to urban life, especially the 1918 to 20 um, flu epidemic. But uh, I think the, the important thing to realize is none of them ever succeeded in denting the role of large cities or the ongoing march of urbanization. Um, now, uh, with every event, uh, every major event in human history, there will be people who will come along and say, oh, but this time it's really different. And the this time is different argument comes from an obvious fact, which is that um, it's the first time we've had widely available remote interaction, such as we are doing right now, for work and shopping and communicating. Um, arrayed against that, however, is that um, there's a long line of failed forecasts that this time distance is dead. In fact, if you look over the last um, two centuries or so, that almost every time a major um, new uh, transportation technology was invented, say um, barge canals in the 19th century, and then railroads, and then cars, and then the telephone, um, and then airplanes, and then um, on and on and on, you get a burgeoning journalistic and scientific literature saying, that's it, density is over, we're all gonna, you know, we're all gonna commute from our cottages and we don't need to be together. And um, the problem with all of those predictions is they've always been wrong. In fact, um, they've always been dead wrong in the sense that not only did urbanization continue, but um, in some way, and, and sometimes you did see the, what we might call a change in the internal form of urbanization, meaning that the internal density of cities uh, uh, did decline, things like suburbanization, but that, that the appearance of cities and the growth of cities and the, and, the, and, the, and the percentage of people living in cities has never declined with any of these events. So that's, I think, important perspective when uh, right now we hear the kind of death of cities discourse coming about. Um, in our paper, we speculate on four potential areas of change, though, that this pandemic is going is is bringing about that we're living through now, and we want to think about the forces that they're unleashing in the future. So uh, the four are social scarring, that is the fear of crowded interactions, um, some kind of um, effects of this experiment that we're now living through on um, uh, remote using remote interaction technologies for employment shopping, uh, workplace and residence choice and commuting. Um, the third is securing the built environment against ongoing health and climate risks. And the fourth is kind of linked to the third, which is changes in built form, real estate markets, design and streetscapes. And let me run through some of our speculations about each of those four areas. And, and I think a good way to think about this is that we're trying to think about what we might call the social and market uh, forces that are being unleashed as, and a dynamic of feedbacks in each of these areas and what that might mean for urban life post COVID, but also the challenges to urban planning. So let's think about social scarring inside the city. And, and, and what, we're gonna, what we do in the paper is we think about two scales. One is we might say intra-regional within the metropolis in its internal organization and form. And the other is we think about city systems, which is how are different cities in, um, in a nation's urban system gonna be affected possibly by the reallocation of people and, and work. So think about two scales. Um, so social scarring, um, our, is fear of crowds and density going to last and change our behaviors uh, durably? So of course we've lived through in the last eight months, lots of rumors of mass moving away from city centers and people looking for suburbs and of course young people going home to their parents' houses and uh, things like that. Um, the background for this of course is that in a lot of the world there's been a return to the city in recent years and that the younger generation, the millennials, are staying longer in city centers than previous generations did. Meaning that in the previous generation, when people got to family formation and childbearing age, they left for the suburbs. And this generation is doing that, but they're doing it later. 
which means that there's more pressure on the inner city than there was for a couple of generations. Um, and I think the, uh, what we know about this is that it depends on which part of the population we're talking about. There is an older high income population with settled careers that appear possibly to accelerating the move away that they might have already done at some age, um, going for comfort and already having their social and work networks established. Um, and uh, to some extent reversing the recent trend of an older population that was moving downtown and seeking urban amenities and bright lights. Um, families with children, it's probably little change going on, but maybe, maybe a little bit of adjustment in the life cycle of when they would move to the suburbs. Although nothing in real estate data yet confirms any of this stuff. There was a little bit of a blip of it uh, in um, say, um, April, May, June of this year, but the, even the real estate search sites, um, they don't show any kind of mass movement away. Um, the younger, the skilled, and the single, who are of course a huge um, part of the kind of moving into the city population, is remote work going to cause an outflow and kill off densification and with it gentrification? We believe it's unlikely. Um, and that's because there are few amenities in other areas to replace the city in the life of these kind of people. And I'll talk about that more, kind of knowledge workers. Um, and this in part depends partly on uh, the future of work that I'm gonna come to in a second. Okay, what about the urban system? Um, will social scarring change the urban system? And the background here is of course, the last uh, 30 years is, in the urban systems of most developed countries and some developing ones, there's a set of superstar cities or superstar metropolitan areas that see merge. And um, that is a very pronounced phenomenon. If we, if we measure it, I've just recently measured it using US data going back to 1940, and what you might call the wage premium for people moving to very big cities is as high, it's the highest point that it's been since 1940, right? And, um, and the, the, what that means is that the attraction of the big city is very real. And it's real even after you take into account housing costs um, and other kinds of disadvantages to moving to the big city. Um, in fact, uh, a, a, a knowledge type worker who goes to a superstar city like say Sydney or Melbourne, or you know, in America, it'd be San Francisco or Boston or Washington or LA or New York or in Europe, it would be Paris or London or Munich, um, that, um, that there are just multiple advantages still that are hardwired into the into these superstar cities, including uh, very good career learning opportunities, high, high real wages, uh, real estate capitalization along the life cycle, and access to a hugely increased pool of amenities in the last 20 or 30 years that's been created as a result of that kind of feedback mechanism. So what if, what would happen though? Would, what if the geography of high skilled employment is gonna change through some kind of substitution of zooming like we're doing right now for interactive cope presence? Then that logic could change. And one could imagine the urban system going into reverse from what it's been doing the last, um, actually the last 40 years. This is really a post 1980 phenomenon that we've reached a kind of, uh, a kind of apogee of right now. Um, so that leads us to the question of um, the forced experiment that we're living through in work and um, in, 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 in commerce. That is, is it really gonna change the geography and nature of work? Um, and I think to get into this, you might think about three kinds of work. There's the essential work that cannot be done remotely um, and, but is not high touch or heavily public facing. That's things like infrastructure, construction and maintenance. And I think we can see there's gonna be very little change in that. It's just locationally fixed. Think about then high touch public facing work like healthcare workers, waiters, shop clerks. Um, and there's gonna be some, some substitution by distance technologies here. Um, but I speculate or we speculate that people will want to go back to restaurants and bars and live entertainment once this pandemic is under control. Uh, and the evidence for this is that they did in 1920 after the flu epidemic ended. And um, many people may not know, but that was a very severe flu epidemic 
with um, massive closure of bars and restaurants and live entertainment in 1918 and 1919 and mask wearing and a lot of the things we're living uh, through today. Um, and there was, uh, there was a really big economic hit to those sectors in 1918 and 1919, but a huge rebound in 1920 after the third wave of the flu epidemic basically generated uh, herd immunity. Now, of course, um, shopping will be changed permanently, but it won't be eliminated by click and collect or click and ship. Um, retail was already changing before the pandemic, right? And we'll, we'll return to the effects of what was, what's been sometimes called the retail apocalypse that was occurring even before the pandemic due to um, internet shopping. Um, so what about, so those, those two, I think we, we know something about. What about knowledge work, meaning <clears throat> interaction, non-routineness, and, and performance, like the arts and teaching and politics? Um, these are the workers who are, in some ways, most amenable to working um, entirely on Zoom. Um, this is the big open question. How much will it change? So what about the future of knowledge work? That's the group of, uh, that's the group of workers that's grown a lot in um, advanced economies and that it particularly populates the superstar uh, city's economic base. So um, <clears throat> how, now we are of course rife with speculation about you know, the end of face-to-face -face contact and interaction and that this is our new life. Um, I will be very strong on this and argue that the Zoom life, you know, much as I'm happy to be seeing, um, to be participating right now uh, because it's certainly better than, as they say, nothing. It's not an adequate substitute for face-to-face -face contact in a number of ways that we're already seeing. Uh, for example, it's hard to stay focused for long periods of time on Zoom. Um, it's a much more limited form of communication than co-presence because it lacks spontaneity, it lacks the motivating effect of being in the same room together, and it lacks the parallel processing of rapid back and forth and body language and all kinds of other attributes of um, actual human face-to-face -face contact. So, so I think that the, um, the, a, a, a decent speculation is that Zoom is a way to prolong work life using established teams or people or networks in established roles, but it's not a good way, or it's not certainly not as good a way to integrate new people new cohorts and new generations into the creative or knowledge-based uh, or innovation-based work process. What we're doing right now, eight months into this, is we're treading water and there's an unsatisfied uh, built-up demand for being together again that will be unleashed when the worst of this is over. Zoom, in other words, is a partial substitute, but it's only a partial substitute. So that leads, I think, to um, a couple of speculations about the effects of this forced lockdown on work location, that there will be some substitution of Zooming from a five-day week to a more variegated week involving co-presence and homework. That will, I, I believe we, we will evolve toward a hybrid model of work uh, that will not involve being in the office or in the city all the time. This is all, this was already occurring in academia where you know people like me would always try to work a day or two at home per week if we could. Um, and that will be that I think is going to be extended to a lot of other sectors. Um, some professionals, of course, those with really high or independent status who can kind of call their own shots may indeed choose a remote uh, locations and occasionally travel to cities because they have personal human capital and they're in high demand, they can do whatever they want. But for most of us, I think we'll snap back to either an old pattern of going to the office or we'll blend home and office in a somewhat different pattern from previously. Here in France, actually, we had a very, a, 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 uh, the government did a, a, a big survey the other day. And what they found is that a lot of people really want to go back to their offices. Um, they're actually kind of sick of being at home or they don't have a big enough home to be comfortable in. Um, they're too distracted by their spouses and kids and the refrigerator and other things like that. And they really are, they, they, they don't want to stay home forever. Now, of course, res this, this can affect 
residential choices in a wide variety of ways. And this will be something I think we really want to keep our eyes on in the next two or three years, which is some people will choose intra-regional locations that are more remote and more spacious or cheaper because working at home requires more space and we're already seeing the strain of this. So some people will adjust in that direction. Um, on the other hand, urban living has a lot of space density amenities that one doesn't get from a more remote location. Say your average suburb doesn't have the same amenities as a denser inner city area. And those are trade-offs that we all make all the time. Once those amenities reopen, right now in a lot of places like where I live in Paris, they're closed. Um, but once those amenities come back, the value of proximate dense urban space will be reaffirmed. And um, E, indeed, some journalists have already suggested that even if you're going to be on lockdown, it's actually less boring in a city center than a suburb. Now, those are all kind of qualitative dimensions. So what we need to keep our eyes on is what are the behaviors and the kind of arbitraging that different people are going to do as they come out of this. What about urban system effects? Uh, that is sort of turning to this other scale. Will companies decide that locating the superstar cities is no longer necessary? if they can source their workers remotely by Zoom? What about the rumors that say some companies will put their, allow their workers to work from anywhere, but adjust their wages downward if the people live in um, cheaper places? That's what Facebook already announced. Um, so rate, one thing to know, of course, is the rates of re remote work potential vary greatly. I mean, remote meaning, um, uh, meaning working from home. During the pandemic, the knowledge intensive centers have seen the greatest move to homework. So while office towers are empty in the superstar cities like San Francisco or London or New York, but in places like Mississippi where there aren't very many knowledge workers, there are a few towers to empty in the first place. So the base level is really different. Even between LA and San Francisco, which are two cities I've studied, the percentage is much higher in San Francisco. It has a much higher density of knowledge workers than LA does. Um, so some downsizing of office space may indeed occur if work patterns are going to go to this sort of partial week um, or sort of on and off presence. Uh, one kind of legendary story that we have from LA is that Netflix already does this in its buildings in Hollywood through permanent hot desking. So people come in and you have to find your space for the day. And a lot of people end up sitting on the floor all day if they arrive too late because there aren't enough desks for people. Um, so these are probably some, some, there will be some downsizing of office space, and that'll induce some changes in commercial real estate markets. Um, entertainment, the arts, museums, and all that, they're going to revert to their central place geography. They are dependent on city size and the ecosystems that feed them. There's just no replacing the remote, the, the, the in-person experience for, for a remote one. However, however really impressive the efforts are of these institutions to get us through uh, the pandemic. And there will be a pent up desire to travel and see things. It'll take three or four years to get back to previous levels. So will the superstar cities lose their knowledge workers to other cities? Already there are some cities that are out there kind of fishing for them. In America, Tulsa, which is in the center of the country in Oklahoma, it has a thing, it has a program called Tulsa Remote, and it's telling knowledge workers, you know, come to Oklahoma, it's look, it's cheap, there's a lot of space, um, and you can do your work on, on Zoom permanently. And I think there will probably be some marginal peeling off of the more routine jobs that are embedded in the knowledge economy. But this is really a big decision if you're a worker. It means that you are really permanently going away from easy contact and easy networking and that your experience curve in work life is going to change. Your, con your, your, your address book will change if you move to, uh, away from San Francisco to Tulsa. So this is a, this is a, 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 a serious choice that will affect careers. Um, and that's why we think it will not be on a massive scale. The intermediate cities, rural areas, and small towns are not going to benefit from massive relocation of knowledge workers carrying out non-routine tasks. Superstar cities are, 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 are likely to continue their attractiveness to the scaled, um, and um, they are likely to pick up again with the fourth industrial revolution. Um, 
I'm, con I'm conscious of running out of time. So I wanna, I wanna just do a couple things real, real quickly, maybe without um, being able to go over them. Uh, let me make a couple. So one other point we try to make in the paper is that there's gonna be some kind of permanent adjustment in the costs of operating cities. And that's because we need to secure the built environment more durably for health and safety. So all of our public facilities, all gathering spaces are gonna have a whole new cost gradient that will be adjusting how we build and maintain cities. Um, and, and a final area is this question of, well, what are like commercial and sort of public uh, real, uh, like what are, what are sort of high streets going to look like or major commercial streets and districts and boulevards um, just a reminder, the retail apocalypse was already starting before the pandemic. We're obviously going through a very big short-term hit to commercial activity. I don't know what it's like in Australia, but certainly in the other places I've seen, it's very, very, very big. Um, and we needed, and there was already in many um, localities, a kind of a rethinking uh, prior to the pandemic of how we're going to um, make uh, how we're going to reshape these um, spaces. And um, there are sorts of, we could think about sort of good, good, good and bad sides to this because commercial real estate has become highly gentrified in a lot of superstar cities, leading to a widespread critique that they're becoming sort of like homogeneous chain, sco chain uh, store landscapes and that sort of local businesses and sort of the funkier or more creative side of consumption was being driven out of our more successful uh, cities. And we think that um, there, uh, so, so we, we might want to think about sort of the interaction of, of these different effects in the past. And there probably will be a, a, a demand and supply reconfiguration of urban built land uses. Probably um, some, if commercial real estate loses enough of its values, we, we might think about opportunities to repurpose it as live workspaces meaning um, actual streetscapes could change, having a residential component and a, and, a, and a maker component. We might also think about, um, um, we might also think about uh, this as a way to ease gentrification pressures and some conversion of commercial real estate into mixed residential and commercial. So we might think about creative forms of urban re re reinvention. So a bunch of, bunch of areas that we're trying to speculate about. And let me sort of conclude with this point, that all of these changes, we, we sort of starting to think about what are the forces that are being unleashed, which are demand and supply forces and all kinds of complex interactions within cities and between them. All right, that's kind of the main message of our paper. But I think that the, the final comment I wanna make is, there's a challenge as to how we want, as with any moment of great urban change, the challenge is also is always what set of values and objectives is going to guide the kinds of policies that and, 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 and planning measures that we put into place. One of my professors, Sir Peter Hall, the great British urbanist, he talked about great planning disasters. And great planning disasters come when we don't understand the underlying feedback dynamics of cities. These are these ultimate complex systems. And when we intervene with them, Sometimes we get unintended consequences. Indeed, sometimes exactly the opposite of what we want. So we really have to understand what kinds of forces are being unleashed. And that leads to, of course, the values question, which is, are we going to shape them in an inclusive way? Right? There's a lot of short-term suffering and difficulty. And there are some signs already that we're getting kind of a new fortress urbanism. You know, towers in Miami that are built to protect the rich from the effects of climate change and from, and from, and, and from health risks, but that really don't uh, lead to a kind of inclusive and more socially just form of urbanism. So there's a risk here that we will not see the occasion in two ways. One is by not understanding the feedbacks that are being un, un, unleashed. That's a kind of a technical task of, of analysts. And then I think the other part is figuring out you know, what kind of values we want to impose on the ways that we intervene. And, uh, and, and avoiding uh, this tendency for fortress or urbanism and making sure that whatever comes out of it is livable 
um, more equality producing, more enlightening to the human spirit or what we might call inclusive urbanism. Uh, sorry, I went over my time. Thank you very much for um, listening. Thanks so much, Michael. And we will have time, people who are listening at the end, for questions to Michael. But it's my very great pleasure now to hand over to one of the planners who's going to have to take up those challenges, Michael, that, um, that you so eloquently talked about from Paris. We've got Stephanie Barker here in the studio, who is well known to planners in Australia. In fact, she was New South Wales Planner of the Year last year. And at the moment, she's currently Chief City Planner at the Western and Parkland Authority. Over to you, Stephanie. Thanks so much, Nicole. We'll just get the presentation up. But I'd just like to start by saying the amazing thing about writing about the pandemic during a pandemic is we're all experiencing it together. And to a certain extent, we're all experts because we're all living it day to day and having, you know, it affect our families and our lives, um, you know, across the board. So in, back in April, I was asked, we'd finished um, the assurance process for local councils, um, local strategic planning statements, and I was asked to shift my focus to looking at what the city shaping impacts of COVID-19 could be. And as I say, we we're all experiencing it, but we really went hunting for data. And as Michael pointed out, things are shifting so rapidly, just when you think you're getting some good data on something, it, it changes. But look, I'll start with some of the obvious and, and move through. You know, we had immediate impacts with, um, you know, significant um, job losses, but sitting in behind that data of um, unemployment are some stark facts around you're, you're twice as likely to not be in work at the moment if you're under 25 than if you're over 25. There's also been significant impacts on women. But there's another hidden element of that, which is also underemployment. It's really exposed the gig economy and uh, casualization of the workforce. And that's the dark blue line you can see on the graph there. That was impacted the most. And our youth panel at the Greater Sydney Commission talked to us about, you know, just getting one shift a week and not being able to say no because then they get sacked. So, you know, it, it, it is really um, impacting certain parts of our community. Looking, but also then at how jobs have changed, you know, not everyone could work from home. We had, I think it was around 9% or so that are unemployed. We've got a group of people who are essential workers, um, teachers, hospital workers and the like. There's about 47% of people had work that um, would allow them to work flexibly, work remotely from home or from other locations. And what's interesting about that, as Michael pointed out, it's large, it, I think you're twice as likely to be working from home if you're a knowledge worker. So it meant that, um, you know, ferries were empty because they were the, you know, where the knowledge workers main form of transit to get to the CBD. It affected different types of transport in different ways. And so it impacted Sydney in different ways where parts of Sydney where we've got more knowledge workers um, in the north and east of the city um, compared to um, other parts of the city as well. Uh, the upside of some of the um, pandemic's been really interesting in terms of how we've worked together. The government had to make a bunch of decisions really quickly. And with uh, a lot of reliance on health advisors, they made evidence-based decisions and they collaborated with industry. And there was some really, you know, fast, thorough decision-making that was operationalised just with you know, such um, speed. We saw uh, infrastructure, um, you know, uh, projects uh, being able to benefit from changed uh, work hours. Um, we saw, you know, uh, shops and businesses adapt to, you know, sanitise all those things, you know, and now like there's some places where there's only one of you allowed in the lift at the time. We adapted, we got on with it, we put the things in place and we, we've done really well. But I think a lot of that came from evidence-based responses that were collaborative and consultative. So I'd like to see that continue into the future. And uh, now just sort of going on to sort of lifestyles or livability, some people call it, looking at what's been changing there. We are spending more time, we're spending more money in our local um, communities. There's uh, been a 12% increase in spending of our you know, I think we've got 1,300 local centres. That's up compared to our 40 or so strategic centres. But then um, that changes once uh, in parts of Western Sydney where places like Penrith, Campbelltown and Liverpool actually have a really local and a, and a, a district sort of function. 
Um, people are spending more time in the public spaces in their local communities as well. So we're seeing a lot of localism and, and that um, greater activity in the local community. And there's you know, interesting discussions around what you could do to support people being able to work remotely, that they get the social contact. They may have work hubs that not necessarily from home, but they're not having to commute. And so somewhere in between that. Uh, the other thing that's been um, really came off the back of the bushfires, well-being entered our lexicon much more regularly after the uh, summer last year and the bushfire impacts were just so severe. And going into the pandemic, we now talk about well-being across the community you know, all the time. Um, and I don't know if any of you have had to help elderly parents learn how to use Zoom. I, I empathise with, greatly with that one. Uh, the homeschooling, getting kids um, through that. But, you know, even um, stories like people, even when they could still play sport, having to leave immediately afterwards. And like, that's half the fun of, you know, playing the game is talking to everyone when you finish. Um, you know, other, just the disruption to life, you know, um, processes that in place, not being able to visit community for sorry business, not being able to, you know, get citizenship. Um, so the, the oh, shift through, yeah, it's so a local communities, more public spaces use um, and more time um, in public spaces, you know, for exercise and also for gathering. We know transit's changed and there's those concerns about, um, you know, public transport. But we're seeing, you know, people cycling, walking and um, more driving less. And it's been great to see Transport for New South Wales implement so many temporary bikeways um, straight away to, to grasp some of that behaviour change. Uh, digital, look, you know, we're all doing a lot more. But what's um, interesting is just how important digital is. And it's sort of not an add-on. It's something that's very foundational now to the way we live. But a lot of the way we design for it is as an add-on. Um, you know, so we've heard, you know, Mark talking about how it may impact people's choice of where they live. And, you know, we're seeing a surge in Greenfield slots at the moment in um, Western Sydney in, in Greenfield sales. But, you know, maybe some housing incentives, but also people being able to work flexibly or wanting a larger home so they can work from home. But they can work from anywhere. They can work from the park bench. If the digital technology is there, we can work flexibly. And then we've got hybrid systems where some people at home and some people are in the office. Another element is around supply chains. And, you know, we're learning about having essential services, food supply, health services onshore so that we can de-risk them. It means having some redundancy in our supply chains. And there's, diff that, that's, you know, we've always worked on very efficient supply chains. So it's a different way of thinking about those as well. But just to finish, I think what the main um, thing uh, that's really coming through is that, as Michael also sort of uh, pointed to, some of these changes are going to be structural and I'd argue the technological ones are structural change. Many of it is, a lot of it is acceleration of existing trends, but, you know, really rapidly accelerating. Other things are cyclical and, you know, I don't wonder whether the CBDs will adapt as they have always adapted and that might be more of a cyclical change that we see. So using scenarios to test, you know, the different sorts of outcomes is going to be important to making planning decisions and, and monitoring and, and seeing how we go forwards. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. And from Sydney, we're going to go to Hobart, Melbourne and back to Sydney for a bit of a national picture. And I'm going to introduce our three speakers in reverse order. Once again, we'll have questions and comments to Stephanie at the end. So in reverse order, we've got Di Griffith, one of um, Australia's most experienced and well-respected urban planners and urban designers, a fellow of the Planning Institute of Australia and founding director of Studio GL. In Melbourne, we've got Professor Carl Groddock, Foundation Professor and Director of Urban Planning and Design at Monash University. His research straddles urban planning, policy, geography, sociology and design, and he's particularly been working on urban revitalisation most recently. And in Hobart, Irene Duckett, Director of Irenic Planning and Urban Design Consultancy Firm based in Hobart. She, Irene is a Fellow of the Planning Institute of Australia, but she says that the most important fact about her is that she was Tasmanian before it was cool. Over to you, Irene. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I'll just get... Excellent. 
Okay, are these, can you see that? Uh, for those of you who have not been to Tasmania yet, I'll just give you a quick orientation. Um, Tasmania's population is about half a million, slightly over, um, half of which live in Hobart. So um, just to give you that perspective, um, Tasmanians have a really close relationship with the natural environment and given our relatively small and low density population, even in the city, no one's really far from the bush. So you can see how the, the bush, and that's one of the delightful things about Hobart is that the bush is part of our city. However, we are also facing threats from bushfires, as other, the rest of the country is. In 1967, the Black Tuesday bushfires resulted in 67 deaths and the destruction of large swathes of urban Hobart. So slightly different to what a lot of the other states are facing where their uh, bushfires are in more rural and outlying areas, we face a very real threat to our, very, our city centre. Um, our, our technology mapping and knowledge of bushfires is rapidly growing as it is in all other states. Building regulations require construction to a bower rating, but bower ratings are designed to a fire danger index of 50. Um, and severe, extreme or cataclysmic ratings have a fire danger rating of 50 to 100. Currently, southeastern Tasmania, where you can see these 67 outbreaks were and where our population density resides, the FDI index exceeds 50 at a frequency of uh, a one in three year event. So in reality, the regulation that we have can't save us. Um, and it doesn't apply to existing housing stock either. So we can't eradicate risk in establishing the baseline for tolerable risk. The community needs to be aware of the actual risk and can make informed decisions in choosing where to live maintaining bushfire clearance, um, making, uh, preparing the, and preparing the bushfire management plans. So community education is vital and the tools for mapping and identifying risks are evolving rapidly. Uh, this year, our state government launched Risk Ready, a poverty-based website which not only generates a report for any given address of known risk of natural hazards such as landslide, inundation and bushfire risk, but also provides information or directs to other sources of, to help manage, understand and mitigate that risk. With COVID, however, our risk of tolerance was low. Um, given that Tasmania has one of the most aged populations in Australia, the implications of spread were evident and the government's response in Tasmania was swift, closing our state borders in late March. Tasmania has eradicated all known cases of COVID by early May, having recorded 230 cases and 13 deaths. Um, we then enjoyed relative freedom of movement around the state, and it was largely this which protected us from the worst of the economic impacts. While we didn't have the tourists on which Tasmanian economy is largely dependent, conversely, we didn't see the springtime exodus of Tasmanians heading to Queensland and other warm places. Tasmanians use the opportunity to spend locally and enjoy the sites absent tourism, tourist crowds. We've also become the beneficiaries of the Melbourne and Sydney exodus that um, Michael was talking about, the people moving, the people moving from the city. Um, seeing the establishment of a Facebook page, That's It, I'm Moving to Tassie, which now boasts 16,000 followers. Um, because people could see that Tasmania had the sustainable and compact lifestyle that started to become valuable. And as Stephanie mentioned, well-being became a far more important value. Uh, we don't have the full um, population figures yet, but Comsec, um, Comsec state of the state figures have rated Tasmania as the highest performing state for the third consecutive quarter this year, with the highest relative population growth. This does come with a downside. Pre-COVID, we were already facing issues of housing affordability. Uh, with average housing prices, which are well below Sydney or Melbourne, they have risen 50% in the past five years and continue to rise at a rate of 11% in the past year, exceeding every other state capital. As this is not matched with rise in income, housing affordability and housing supply are 
key issues currently facing Tasmania. Um, it's not all grim. Moving forward, we have great opportunities for Tasmania. We have two city deals in place, which provi are providing direction for the bucket of infrastructure spending that we're about to face. Uh, we're still playing catch up with a suite of planning policies and most importantly, uh, a meaningful settlement strategy to guide population growth and economic investment. And now we're going to shift over to Carl. Okay, um, I hope I get through it because my internet connection it's not working so well, but I'm, I'm gonna to try to keep it extremely brief for you. Um, my, my, my basic takeaway from looking at the panels of the festival and, and thinking through COVID is, um, I mean, one, I think that COVID has recentered our attention on cities in a way that we, we really haven't seen prior. And it's, it's highlighted all these pre-existing challenges that we're dealing with from transportation and housing to employment, to access to neighborhood resources. Um, but we're, we're getting to this stage now where we've seen some interesting experimental um, change and some interesting ideas, but at the same time, this kind of business as usual um, ap approach um, is, is increasingly creeping forward. And, and I think Michael's closing comment around thinking about the values that guide change is, is a really good way to think forward um, in, in how we're gonna respond um, and, and think about a post COVID city. But, um, We've, I think in Australia and Melbourne, we've been good at um, some quick response, some Band-Aid solutions, um, quickly housing homeless, responding to rental stress and eviction, job insecurity, unemployment. It's not perfect, but I mean, it's been a tremendous change from what I think it could have been. Um, Melbourne has adapted its streets and public spaces like many, many other cities. Um, we've seen the changes from remote work, of course, um, and in Melbourne, this has elevated the kind of discussion around 20 minute neighborhoods, this idea coming from Plan Melbourne and that everyone should be able to walk and bike to their everyday needs within a 20 minute, um, uh, you know, walk or bike. Um, and, and so there's a lot more discussion around there and, and both the equity and climate change impacts of that. Um, and, and so while we've seen a lot of good discussion and some, some quick policy um, that I think has had a positive stopgap measures. At the same time, the old ways of business aren't, aren't going away. And, and I think some of the panels um, that we've heard previously during the festival highlighted that. Um, we're continuing to see a focus on big spend infrastructure and these kind of reactive job strategies, reactive planning strategies. Um, Melbourne's been great with adapting public spaces, but it's also uh, implementing free parking to try to get people to come down to the CBD to spend money. Uh, in New South Wales, we've heard calls for um, adapting to changing businesses by loosening restrictions on zoning, particularly industrial lands, uh, which, which will be priced out. Uh, industrial uses will be priced out from any kind of rezone change there. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're just starting to pick through the no, new Victorian budget, the COVID budget, um, which ha has a lot of really positive um, things in it. It's very comprehensive, but I mean, what hits you forefront is this focus on fast tracking big infrastructure projects as a job strategy, as a community building strategy. Um, even looking at the creative industries, the, the emphasis is on cultural infrastructure rather than artistic livelihoods or artistic production. And so, I mean, we really, it, we really are at this point where we need to step back um, and kind of think about the changes that we've seen, where we expect to go with population growth, with economic change, um, we haven't spoken about the kind of deglobalization that is beginning to define some of these decisions from Trump and Brexit to Australia's relationship to China. Um, and, and, I, and I think really pull back from that kind of knee jerk infrastructure focus to build our way out of um, a recession, um, to focus on getting more people consuming uh, and, and look towards refocusing our economic development and planning systems um, to directly lead with more positive social benefits and support that we've seen coming out of, of COVID, as well as think about how we're going to create um, new quality jobs and, and reskilling a population that is unemployed from this coronavirus recession. Thank you, Carl. 
And lastly, I'm going to hand over to Di Griffiths. And after Di, we'll have some Q&A, probably going first to Michael. And then I can see these questions coming in from the audience. We'll be sharing those with the local panel after that. Thanks, Di. Excellent. So um, I've been asked to sort of t um, wrap this up a little bit and also um, think about how this, um, all these ideas actually relate to Sydney and how we could um, design, uh, make Sydney a better place. And I think, you know, what's happened over the last 12 months is we've really been forced to rethink our cities, um, how we use the network of buildings and streets and open spaces that we have. And Sydney in um, 2019 uh, had the highest, um, the longest average commuting time of all of the cities in Australia, 71 minutes, and that was average. And suddenly in 2020, for some people, their average commuting time went to zero. And uh, I think for a lot of people, they've kind of actually enjoyed that additional time and the flexibility that that's provided. Um, and I'm, I'm really reluctant to work to return to a five-day-a-week um, commute. And I also think um, this understanding um, is, is a real gift. Um, people With more people working from home, suddenly we actually have some flexibility and some uh, sort of spare capacity in our transport networks and in our, in our um, urban environments. And so there's this question, what do we do with this gift that we've suddenly been, um, been provided with? We don't have to play catch up. We can actually um, you think about the type of city that we want to be. Um, we've also uh, learned about that critical importance of open space, as Stephanie pointed out, you know, people are spending more time outside, more time um, sort of enjoying the green spaces and are really attracted to this sort of green and, and pleasant um, and simpler life. Um, and so what's happened and what might that, what might, might that, what impact might that have on Sydney? And one of the things it could do is, you know, we know that there has been an interest in rural properties and moving to Tasmania. Um, and, you know, maybe with the acceptance of virtual communication, maybe that means people will move out. But the challenge we've got is that, you know, you combine that with the trend, um, with climate, you combine that trend of sort of de-emptying our cities with, with climate change and the need to uh, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, reduce our um, urban footprint, uh, go to more cycling and, and, and um, uh, walking and travelling less. So how could we actually kind of deal with both those issues, both the um, an opportunity for that desire for more space, but also that need to create more efficient cities? And I think one of the things we could be looking at is, is actually this idea of uh, more polycentric city regions. So um, embracing that local that people have um, started to really um, connect with their communities and their local shops and their local open spaces. Um, and, and the people who live in their neighbourhood, but, um, uh, but also connect those more efficiently together. And one of the things, and you know, um, economic rationalists may argue that uh, potentially a dispersed approach is less efficient, but you know, in this era of uncertainty and, and, um, and, and climate change, you know, is there a long-term value in actually building in redundancy and spare capacity and, that, um, and, and going for a more fractal system rather than a, a centralised system, which is so vulnerable um, to the shocks and changes that we're facing? And I think finally, the most powerful lesson sort of I've learned from COVID, and I think many people have, is wherever we live and whatever we do, um, we're all connected. And therefore, the security of the nation is intrinsically linked to the health um, of our social networks and local communities. And um, Ross Gittins, a few months ago, who's a well-known Australian um, economic journalist, wrote this amazing article where he talked about the fact that well-known economists are starting to come to the conclusion that neoliberalism, um, which has long dominated the economic advice to governments, has led us astray. And he notes that um, in Greed is Dead, um, uh, Collier and Kay argue that the problem with market fundamentalism is that it is the overemphasis on the role of competition between self-interested individuals in generating economic progress. By sanctifying selfishness, isn't that beautiful? Um, it has undermined the community mindedness and the role of cooperation in advancing our mutual interests. Um, he notes that uh, in another book, uh, the Third Pillar by Rajan, he argues that society is supported by two obvious pillars, by the state and by markets, but it's also supported by what has been a long neglected third pillar, which is the community. 
and that is the social aspects of our society. And so I think if we're talking about post-COVID, um, what, what, would, what would our cities, what would our places be like? Instead of um, you know, considering an assessment of social impacts when we're thinking about development and the future of our cities as a minor and possibly not terribly important thing, what if that actually became preeminent and we actually said that it's the, the social pillar and the community pillar needs as much weight and as, not, as much consideration and as much support as the market pillar. Mm. Thanks, Di. You really pulled together a very diverse and very rich conversation there. Thank you. Um, to people who are listening, we're going to extend a little past six o'clock so that we've got at least 10 minutes time for, sorry, a little past seven o'clock for in Sydney time. So we've got a little bit more time for questions. And I'm going to throw the first question back over to Paris, if I might. And uh, Michael, if you're still there, the messages that you gave in your talk and certainly that's come out in several of our panellists has been very much uh, that the pandemic and for us in Australia, the bushfire before it, magnified a lot of existing problems, a lot of existing pathologies. And yet we see in government responses and perhaps even in some of the, the forces that you were alluding to in your presentation, we see a pushback to business as usual. Do you see any opportunities for a better future of the kind that Di was perhaps um, sketching a picture of? And if so, you know, what might planners do to help take us there? Well, I think that <clears throat> actually it is brilliant what the, what the other panelists um, said about that very issue that you are, are raising. And I think what's interesting to me, I think all of us are converging on this notion that uh, the pandemic is, um, it's a great challenge, but it's potentially a creative moment for cities. Um, I completely agree that the pandemic has revealed fault lines in our urban policies and also in the trends of um, urbanization in the last couple of decades. And so the, uh, the challenge here is indeed to, um, um, on the one hand, uh, rebuild our cities and communities in a way that is obviously more uh, resilient to pandemics and climate change, which are the obvious um, existential uh, challenges to our mode of urbanization. But, e but underlying that, um, all, all of the syndromes that have been mentioned, like, um, you know, there's kind of a fun side of piling all these amenities into cities, but it's involved a huge amount of kind of homogenization and gentrification and driving out all kinds of diversity from our cities or economic and spatial inequality, which is just a dramatic syndrome in every major successful city in the world. And we could go on a long, a long list there. So um, I, I do think the challenge for all of us is to think about the new set of these complex feedbacks that are emerging and with them um, some opportunities. The opportunity is, yes, rebuilding more economically diversified, more, uh, 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 we might say, sort of socially um, interactive and integrated uh, communities. And I would really, you know, sort of add a very strong dose of the need to have social and economic inclusiveness and integration. You know, that might sound like a throwaway term, but it isn't. Um, this is an opportunity to reverse some of the uh, social and economic stratification and segregation that has become a sort of the, the, the huge downside of the re-urbanization of the last 20 or, or, or 30 years. And if we can, um, if we can, if we can sort of establish several just sort of basic pillars of our responses to post-COVID, and I think Carl was exactly right. We have to stop with this kind of thinking about like major infrastructure and just getting back to business and all that. There's a kind of a panic going on, right? Let's get it all going, and and, and think about more like 
a, a, a more set of detailed and subtle interventions to bring about um, this uh, you know, resilient, inclusive, less segregated, um, more interactive communities of the city and within the city, I think that that's the challenge of our generation. And that in a way, the pandemic has given us an opportunity uh, to rethink as, as urbanists and urban planners. Thank you, Michael. That is the perfect point to hand to Stephanie, our planner on the ground. And those of you who've put great questions and comments in the chat, we're going to be sending these to our panellists, anything that we don't get through in the next five minutes. So hang in there and feel free to keep posting stuff. But Steph, I'm going to throw you this um, tricky one. And your, your job is to ground what Michael has said and tell us how we do it, particularly in relation to, as Tracy's asked here, Tracy now has asked, what changes in planning and transport would be needed to allow better planning at the local level for more inclusive, but also for more active communities? Got some ideas? Yeah, I do actually. It's a great question from Tracy. And that's the data we're showing that yes, people are spending more time in their local centres, they're spending more money in their local centres. And what it really made us think about having worked on the region plan for Sydney, there was a lot of focus on the metropolitan centre strategic centres and really, you know, councils were kind of left to do planning for local centres and often, you know, they didn't have resources or money to do that. So, you know, I, I, I would really challenge it, and I know from some of the discussions I've had with local government, they really want to be able to activate local centres more. And there's lots of opportunities, whether it's enhancing the public domain for how people use local centres. Um, there's uh, sort of micro distribution hubs, to, you know, to respond to that massive increase we've had in online and, um, you know, e-commerce so that there's, um, we need those distribution things working. Um, it, it's pointed out to the importance that Sydney's got a very dispersed employment land. So we've got like almost 300 um, industrial precincts. And so that ability to get things locally, you know, that it might be boutique or local to your area, those services, it's really great that they are just down the street and they're not all centralised in one part of, you know, the, the um, city. And, you know, I think other... Um, things around sort of how we can adapt some of the underutilised spaces in local centres, you know, to be work hubs where you might be able to access the sort of te technology support that you would normally go into the office that you don't have at home, but you might be able to do that on a more, on a part-time basis. So I think there's there's lots of opportunities there for local government. Um, they have been at the forefront of this, closing beaches and parks, you know, right when the pandemic started, they, they got hit hard. And so um, I, I think they've really done a great job managing the operational side. And now that we're sort of getting used to what these changes are, seeing what we can do around some of those city shaping and city making things going forwards. Mm. Um, yeah. Great, great opportunity. That is the perfect point to go to. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm, people out there in cyberspace, I'm being heckled inside the studio and I'm just going to ignore it for one moment because I want to flick over to Irene in Hobart to answer the question on regions. Stephanie has told us and Diane and Carl actually have told us in the cities that there's lots of opportunities to turn those city to turn our cities into polycentric places. But surely, Irene, there are new opportunities as well as challenges for the regions. And if I may be so bold as to say Hobart is at least um, surrounded by regional centres, if not um, part of regional Australia, what would your response be? Oh, we very much see ourselves as regional Australia, so that's fine. We're not offended. Um, I think what uh, Michael was saying that, you know, it's all of these pathologies in the cities that, you know, really came to light during the pandemic. Well, what we also found is a lot of these inherent strengths also came to light. Um, the sustainable scale that we operate at in, in Tasmania became our strength. Um, and where development had gone to a scale that was not so sustainable, was more commercially based, relied on um, global markets, they're the ones that suffered. They suffered because they didn't have the um, staff to help, you know, like fruit pickers and things like that. You know, we, we, we're serving to state markets. Those larger markets was, were suffering, but the local markets, they were selling to locals. So farm, you know, the farm sales became farm gate markets or click and collect or 
um, local sales. So they reinvented themselves in a matter of a week or two. It's amazing how rapidly those industries adjusted and those small communities just thrived. Um, one of the weaknesses that Tasmania has had in the past for population growth has been the lack of employment. Um, that's always been a bit of a trade-off for people that they wanted, um, you know, their security and, and range of employment that they get in the larger cities, but they wanted the lifestyle they could, they could have in Tasmania. Again, this the flexibility of workplace has provided the opportunity for the best of both worlds, that you don't necessarily have to live in Melbourne or Sydney to work in Melbourne or Sydney, or you might commute and go there two or three days a week and then spend the rest of your time in Hobart. So... Um, I think it really shows the strength in those regional centres and the sustainability of what I think is an optimum population size. Look, we could keep going, but I'm literally going to be um, <laughs> beheaded if, I, if we continue any further. Thank you very much. Thank you to those of you listening in cyberspace. Thank you to Michael. Thank you to Carl. Thank you to Irene. And thank you to Di and Stephanie.